MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been a number of trials and studies looking at low-cost medication that might have an impact on the efficacy of treatment for prevention of hospitalization for COVID-19. We looked at the UK recovery trial that showed that dexamethasone, a really inexpensive medication, was very effective at reducing mortality in patients with COVID-19 in the hospital, and is today the cornerstone of treatment for patients who are admitted to the hospital. But there's also been a lot of attention on early treatment, ways of preventing people from going to the hospital. We've talked about many different types of early treatment on MedCram, including hydrotherapy, sleep, exercise, dietary changes, and lifestyle in general. A lot of attention has been made to pharmacological interventions early on that might have a benefit, and specifically repurpose medications. One of those medications is ivermectin, and recently there was a randomized control trial that was done out of the TOGETHER trial out of Brazil, and was a collaboration between the Pontifical University in Brazil and McMaster University in Canada. I wanted to spend some time looking at the data, and specifically this original article published in the New England Journal of Medicine titled, The Effect of Early Treatment with Ivermectin Among Patients with COVID-19. Now, realize we've talked about this trial before when we talked about fluvoxamine. Don't forget to check out our video on fluvoxamine, which we published a few months ago, which showed in this trial that fluvoxamine reduced the risk of hospitalization by 30%. And the reason why they were able to find this is because they did a specific type of randomized controlled trial. It was an adaptive platform trial. Now, let me explain what that is. So what they did is they did a multi-center trial, and you can see the blue dots here in the southern portion of Brazil is where they recruited patients for this study. And as you can see here, they recruited 10,467 patients who were assessed for eligibility. Now, because of exclusion criteria, 6,900 of those were excluded, leaving 3,515, which underwent randomization. Now, notice what they did here with randomization. There were people that were assigned to the placebo group, and this placebo group was a placebo group for multiple different intervention arms. 2,100 of them were assigned to different treatment groups. And what were they? There were some that were in the hydroxychloroquine arm. There were some in the lopinavir, ritonavir arm. There were some assigned to receive non-concurrent placebo, some assigned to receive metformin, ivermectin, specifically in this case at 400 micrograms per kilogram for one day, and we'll talk about why that is. And there were some that were assigned to receive doxazosin, some that were assigned to receive interferon lambda, and some that were assigned to receive fluvoxamine. And so as these trials were going on, they were trying to see which one of these interventions might actually prove to be successful. They were trying to do these in parallel so they could find out the best type of treatment early on. Now, when they did the ivermectin for one day, there was, of course, a lot of people that had called in, talked to them, and people that were advocates of ivermectin saying, hey, look, ivermectin for one day is just not long enough. So they switched, and they did it for three days. And that was the other arm that's published in this trial. They're only looking at people in this trial that had gotten ivermectin for three days. And you can see here that there were 679 that were assigned to receive ivermectin for three days, and those 679 received ivermectin, versus those that were assigned to receive placebo, as you can see here in this arm as well. So we're not going to look at this arm here on the right. This will be the data for other papers that will be published. Some of them have already been published, specifically the fluvoxamine, which was published in Lancet, and which we covered here at MedCram that showed a 30% reduction in hospitalization. What we're going to look at today are these two arms here. And as you can see here, there were even in terms of the number of patients that were assigned. Some received ivermectin, some received placebo. And remember, these placebo arms are not exactly the same as the ivermectin. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about per protocol. So when we look down here, 679 received ivermectin, 679 received placebo. And they looked at something called an intention to treat analysis. So in other words, it doesn't matter if they actually took the medication. If they were assigned that group, they were going to see whether or not they made improvement using an intention to treat analysis. Then there was also this modified intention to treat analysis, which was just slightly different by a few people. And then there's this interesting one called the where included in the per protocol analysis. The reason why this is important is if you want a true placebo, 
Remember that some of these assigned groups here are not taking medications for three days. Sometimes they're taking it for 10 days. And so you need someone taking a placebo for 10 days. Well, these people who are receiving placebo, some of them are receiving placebo for 10 days. Some of them are only receiving placebo for three days. And because the ivermectin was only given for three days, you have to do an analysis called a per protocol analysis, where you're comparing those that received ivermectin for three days versus those that received placebo for just three days. And because there were people that received placebo for more than three days, they were excluded from this analysis, leaving only 228 in this analysis. You can do the analysis many different ways, and they did it many different ways. Now, if we look at the characteristics of these two groups at their baseline, not much difference between the ivermectin group and the placebo group. Again, equal numbers here. In terms of their distribution, you can see here going down the list, it's pretty much the same in every single category with very little difference in terms of them. So I think there was very good randomization. And I just wanted to add again for emphasis here what they say in terms of the 228 in the placebo group. Only the results of the three-day ivermectin group as compared with the concurrent placebo group are reported in this article. That's the first thing. Second thing, participants in the placebo group receive placebo for 1, 3, 10, or 14 days, comparable to the active treatment groups in the trial. Remember, there was multiple different treatment groups, multiple different adaptive platforms. Although all the participants who have been assigned to receive any placebo were included in the intention-to-treat population, only those in the three-day placebo groups were included in the per-protocol population. Okay, so what were the results? Let's take a look. We've got the population size here in this column. We have patients with primary outcome events. That would be hospitalization, essentially. And then we have a look at the 95% confidence interval. And again, remember with 95% confidence interval, if it includes the number one, then it is not statistically significant. And as you can see here in the intention to treat population, when we looked at the ivermectin versus placebo, ivermectin was at 14.7, placebo at 16.3, all of them combined 15.5. And as you can see here, there was no statistical significant difference between those two groups. Okay, if we go to the modified intention to treat population, again, very similar, 14.1, 15.9, 15.0. Again, no statistical significant difference between those. If we look at the per-protocol population, again, it's actually closer to each other. Ivermectin here is 13.1, placebo is 13.9. And again, because the reference interval includes 1.00, there is no statistical significant difference between these two groups in this study. Now, one of the critiques of this study has been that really they didn't exclude people who were taking ivermectin from joining the study. In other words, the supposition is, is that the placebo group actually had a number of people in them who were taking ivermectin, and therefore you might not see a difference between the intervention ivermectin group and the placebo group, which may have had some people taking ivermectin. To that criticism, I would just have you read here, in their discussion, they said that ivermectin has been used off-label widely since the original in vitro study by Kali et al. describing ivermectin activity against SARS-CoV-2. And in Brazil in particular, the use of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19 has been widely promoted. We ensured that trial participants did not have a history of ivermectin use for the treatment of COVID-19 by means of extensive screening of potential participants about this issue. Once again, when we look at the map, we can see here the red dots are the cities in Brazil where they receive kits that were full of medications that were prescribed for patients that were coming down with COVID-19. And one of the medications in those kits was ivermectin, which was used. As you can see, those areas are very distinctly different from the areas where the study was conducted for the TOGETHER trial. However, let's say that there were a number of ivermectin patients in the placebo group, and this caused a declination of difference between those two groups. What's interesting about that theory is this is a paper that was published around the same time that subjects were being put into that study in Brazil. And this was a paper that was published in Scientific Reports titled Hospitalization and Mortality Associated with SARS-CoV-2 Viral Clades in COVID-19. And as we read through here, we see that the published percentage of hospitalization rates in the United States at the time, there was substantial variability, but they list it here as around 15%. 
And of course, this is comparing apples to apples in the sense that in this situation, we have clinically confirmed cases. And also in Brazil, they had clinically confirmed cases who had symptoms for less than seven days. And with that published number of 15% without treatment, without early treatment, we can see here that we had about the same hospitalization rates in both the ivermectin and the placebo group, indicating that if there were a number of people in the placebo group taking ivermectin, then it certainly didn't do anything in terms of moving the needle from the established benchmark of 15% hospitalization rates without early treatment. In terms of the dose of ivermectin, they say here that patients who had symptoms of COVID-19 for up to seven days and had at least one risk factor for disease progression were randomly assigned to receive ivermectin at 400 micrograms per kilogram of body weight once daily for three days or placebo. And I just wanted to make sure that we understood that for a 70 kilogram man, that would be 28 milligrams of ivermectin daily for three days versus placebo. This is both early treatment and a reasonable dose. This is actually a higher dose than the FLCCC was initially recommending and is currently on the higher end of the scale that the FLCCC is recommending. Now, this same trial showed that fluvoxamine worked in terms of reducing hospitalizations by 30%. And as you might remember, we did a video on that a few months ago. And it's always exciting to see repurposed medication being used to reduce the incidence of hospitalizations in COVID-19. Let's not forget, it's always great to be able to find medications that can be repurposed, especially if they're cheap, to prevent hospitalizations in COVID-19. But we've done a lot more than that here at MedCram. One of our most popular videos is what to do, what are the 10 tips if you get COVID-19? And we recap, and if you look over our library, we talk about what to do in terms of sleep. You've got to get at least seven hours of sleep per night if you can. We've talked about vitamin D supplementation and other supplements as well, like NAC and quercetin. We've talked also about exercise, the importance of exercise in improving your metabolic health and improving your immune system. We've also talked about diet and fasting. We've talked about these sorts of things. And most recently, we've talked about light and how light exposure improves mitochondrial health and how these things are related to metabolism. And these are the very same things that are the comorbidities in people who get COVID-19. Let's remember that if you really want to be an advocate for yourself, you want to be able to do things that you can do at home without a doctor's prescription, without a test, things that can improve your metabolic health. And as always, we believe in the Swiss cheese model of doing everything you possibly can. Remember, all of these things listed here improve your immune system. And vaccination works better on people who have good immune systems because vaccination uses your immune system. The problem with people that don't have very good immune systems is that vaccination doesn't work well on them because they can't respond well to vaccination. So none of these things are to be considered in lieu of vaccination if you have good quality vaccinations that are highly effective. And I'm simply reviewing these things because this is what the data shows. We've reviewed this data several times. We've done it for the last two years on all of these things. And we here at MedCram don't get paid by anybody. No supplement companies, no vaccination companies. We certainly don't get paid by the sun or by any particular diet fad. I'm recommending that you look into these things because the data shows that these things work. And my motivation for making these videos today is the same as it was two years ago and even 10 years ago when we first started making MedCram videos. It's to educate and to give you knowledge because knowledge is power. Thanks for joining us.